Hey everybody, welcome to No Vacancy. I'm Glenn Hausman, and this week we're taking off, but we're giving you some of our favorite content from the year. We got a lot of great interviews in store for you, so stick around. And also, I want to thank our friends over at uh, Avago, the virtual front desk, which is uh, human assisted. How cool is that? Give them a, a shot. Avago, that's A A V G O. That way, they're going to help you. Manage the guest experience, and there's a lot of features. Check in, check out, upsells, payment method collection, payment processing, reward program connectivity, and you don't need a human being on site, but some human being will be there helping your guests. Please check out Avgo and enjoy this special week of repeat shows. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Happy New Year's, and we'll see you back here in 2023. Well, well, well. Looks like I'm upgrading co-hosts today. I think you might be. Oh, I think I am. <laughs> I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. That is the one and only Dr. Producer Suzanne Bagnera. I am Glenn Hausman. You're watching No Vacancy Live. Suzanne, so great to see you. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm only in Vegas a couple of days, so I've still got it together a little bit, but I really want to encourage everyone to watch all our shows this week as I uh, continue to descend in uh, looks and feelings throughout the entire week. So that should be exciting for us. It is. I'm kind of jealous that you're out on the other coast, but I'm glad you're having fun. Uh, yeah, it's always a good time here in uh, Las Vegas. Although last night, uh, you know, it was great because yesterday afternoon I caught up some friends I haven't seen since pre-COVID, and that was just the best. And I'm doing a lot of that while I'm here on this trip. So many great people in our in our business that I haven't been able to connect with. So it's so much fun to really uh, bring it all uh, together, and you know, and see what's going on here in town. So I'm here right now, coming live at the uh, from the Sky Loft here at MGM Grand. I've got this absolutely incredible two level suite over here i didn't know it was two yeah. levels like oh my goodness you, you yeah. failed to like describe that part of the process with those pictures so that's uh, yeah cool. no i know so here's the uh here's the room and then more room Ooh. and then uh the stairs are right over there and it goes oh, up and right sweet. above here is the uh the bedroom yeah it's really um Although it's I guess really with the cool. word loft there you go <laughs> yeah so i'll tell you about right <laughs> I'll tell you, this whole experience has been kind of crazy. And, you know, I'm not a high roller or anything like that. You know, I get by in life by knowing the right people if I'm lucky. So um, I had a very generous friend who put me up here. We're going to have lunch um, after the show today uh, to talk about what my experiences are here and to talk about the next generation of what's going to be happening here at MGM Grand. So many great things. I have another friend in town that's uh, coming in because there's a major renovation that's going to be going on in the West Wing Towers over here. And um, her product is going to be going in there. So that's pretty exciting to yeah. see, again, the constant redevelopment of this city. But right now, I'm feeling super special. I got picked up in a, in a fancy pants car. Rolls Royce, can you imagine? They let me in one of those things. And, really? Uh, My I was, goodness. Seriously, Suzanne, <laughs> I felt like I was like a total high roller. And it was great to feel VIP, I will tell you. That, that's pretty exciting. You know, sometimes we don't get those opportunities. We just kind of skirt by on our teeth. So to be treated yep. that way, that's pretty cool. I'm yep. excited for you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to get jump into our show in just one second, but I did want to let you know, I don't know what's going on with uh, LinkedIn. We're still having trouble getting those particular uh, comments. So if you're on my feed, those typically come through. If you're watching on Anthony's feed, um, Suzanne, you might not know this, but the way I have this whole system mm -hmm. set up, those never come through. Sure. So if you want to comment, comment on the YouTube page, comment on Anthony's fans, Facebook page, comment on my LinkedIn page. I know it's kind of confusing because we go out to so many different sources, but all you people out there insist on watching it in different places. And it's driving me a little bit crazy, but we want you to be able to watch this great show where we are, wherever you are. All right. Should we jump right into this? Let's go for it. We've got to oh, so like gonna, sprint uh, into it. Yeah. Oh, oh that is a great, great way of saying things. All right. So listen, I'm a huge freak. 
for uh, for Olympics. And I love uh, I love watching all of those different competitions. I don't really like watching typical traditional American sports. You know, I, I love baseball for, you know, going and having beers and hot dogs and that sort of thing. Football, I think, moves a little too slow. Uh, hockey's great, but only in person. I just don't I don't get into all of that stuff, but I can't get enough of Olympics. And our guest today started out as a, a track and field professional wound up in the 2000 Sydney Olympics and then went into a different direction after she retired from that, going into being an executive chef. So I'm really excited today to welcome to our show, Dawn Burrell, an Olympian on the track and field and in the kitchen. Fun was on top of F2. Boy, thanks for bringing your coolness to our show because finally someone who's accomplished is on No Vacancy Live. Wow, what, a, what an introduction. Thank you for having me. It's going to be a really great time. Yeah, this is great. So, uh, good, but I'm actually a jumper. So, yeah. Jump all right. right. <laughs> all right. Jump into it. All right. So, all right. So, here's my uh, bad jokes. It's good for the hospitality industry because you have to jump through a lot of hoops all the time. So you know? Sure. Yeah. No, sorry. No, now that Anthony's not. I know. Not right, exactly. Now that Anthony's not. Like the sound effects. Right about that. Yeah, he does not like my sound effects. But anyway, uh, so Don, I, I got to tell you, like I was saying, I love watching the uh, the Olympics. And as someone who was in the Olympics herself, um, it's really cool, I'm sure, for you to watch younger athletes now compete, take the next generation. But the observation I made at this particular Olympics was every time I turned it on, I, I seemed to be exposed to amazing women athletes. But mm -hmm. in a way that felt normal and organic and not forced and – I just was feeling really good about that. And uh, I think a lot's probably changed since you competed in the summer of uh, 2000, right? Huh. I mean, it surely has. Um, I mean, with the assistance of um, uh, social media, these um, female athletes have um, have connection to their fan base that, unlike ever before. And so that yeah. is empowering. You know, and so I think that you see a lot of that fuel for the for the um, these personalities that are coming out on the field to, to be um, fueled by by that connection with with their with their um, with their fan base. So it's really awesome, and it's great to watch. Yeah, sure. So how did you get involved in uh, jumping and track and field? Well, you know, my my brother uh, blazed a trail. My brother um, Leor Burrell um, mm -hmm. is a two time Olympian and two time wow. world record holder in the hundred meter dash. What? And um, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so like, it was only natural that I follow his footsteps um, all the way. Well, yeah, because he would probably like punch you as a kid, and then you had to go chase him, right? You know, he <laughs> did punch me. He punched. <laughs> he loved to punch me in my legs, and I didn't understand. Like, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, he's, he's a little bit um, older than me, and he always so bossy, and always wanted to tell me what to do. And then I had right. to chase him, or I just cry. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what made you want to go and pursue that? Because that is really, really difficult thing to set your eyes on a goal, like literally 10, 10, 15 years before you, uh, you attain that goal. The reason why I ask this question is because we really all do the same thing in all aspects of our life. But when you are uh, an Olympian and a, you know, of that caliber, people want to hear those types of stories. So tell us a little bit about your story so we could relate it to our own experiences, which are nowhere near as cool. Um, so, I mean, my story is pretty unique because I had a, um, an example to follow, right, mm -hmm. in my brother. Right. So he, he came to University of Houston. I watched him over and over again be number one in the nation and to just, you know, dominate his, um, his, his uh, individual right. um, events. And so I, I, I had that to watch and it, it let me know, you know, that, that those goals, those lofty goals and, and being an Olympian and being number one in the world numerous times in your career is obtainable. Right. You know, and so there, there, all of those things were, um, I watched them do and they were super incredible and I was in awe and I wanted that very same thing for myself. And I knew genetically um, right. I had the same makeup. You know, and so it was just about you know, working hard enough and being diligent enough to obtain the same goals as he had. It probably almost gave you a little bit more sense of confidence, maybe that than some of uh, traditional athletes if they didn't have that blazing path to follow. So that's got to be pretty inspiring then. It most certainly was. I mean, you know, of course, um, athletes that make it, um, they they do have a, a great support system and someone who's always by their side to, telling them that they can do it because that's essentially what coaching is, right? right. You know, um, so you tell and you um, you give them some tools um, to help them reach their goal, but they first have to want the goal themselves. And if they want the goal, um, 
you know, and they have the right coaching, then like the sky's the limit. And also, of course, like the genetic makeup to, to allow you to be able to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, th that was definitely, um, you know, helpful for me to have somebody there in my life that it's my brother closest in age to follow. That's cool. I had the uh, the, the genetic makeup to uh, go to all you can eat buffets. That's about all I could uh, I handle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so uh, what what interests me is uh, you you build up your whole life to get to that experience and you compete in the olympics so mm -hmm. my first question is what was that experience like to you and then what was it like afterwards because you you work your whole life to get somewhere and then right. it's, it's so bizarre well you know the, the perception is that we're part of my life, but first I need to figure out what I was doing, right? So I think that I, I like post collegiately is when I actually started working toward this goal. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was about eight years in, in the making, I think. And um, so what was wonderful um, was that once I did it, I felt this huge sense of accomplishment, but also this incredible like um, terrifying uh, wash came over me because it's like, oh, the stage is so much bigger. The exposure is so much greater right. and, and I've never been there before. So so let me see what I can do here and, and let me try really hard to do the best that I possibly can. So how did you, we, how did, how'd you get past that that fear, that self-doubt, the worry? Um, I... I just, you, I, you just push through it basically. Like, um, I, I don't know that I doubted myself. I just wanted, I wanted so badly to perform. Right. Um, and so that the pressure that I put on myself was really, really great. Um, but I didn't doubt that I could do it. I was just, you know, it's always, um, you know, it's, it's your preparation times your, um, your, I guess you would be like like your mental, your physical and mental pre preparation, mm -hmm. um, along with um, the perfect timing um, that will help you achieve your athletic goals, especially in track and field. You know, and so I was just hoping that everything would come together um, during that season. You, did you feel that it came together for you personally? Because because uh, I really feel in the end, yeah, you're competing against other people, but you're competing mm -hmm. against yourself fundamentally. Um, yes, that's it. absolutely it. I mean, track and field is is just that you just need to make sure that you are mentally and physically prepared, and that you are you are doing enough positive self talk to quiet everything else around you. So it's really you against yourself, and that's really much. That's pretty much how I operate on a daily basis now. Um, but I can say that it did not come together for me um, mm -hmm. at the Olympic Games. Right. Um, but. As you know, as an athlete, I've always been able to um, to, to kind of dust the, the negative experience off and go and perform again because mm -hmm. you know you're only as good as your last race or your last That's jump. Right. And if it wasn't as that great, then you need to do it again so that you can end the season on a positive note. And um, so, for example, at the Olympic Games, I placed 11th and I went to the World Champion. I mean, excuse me, the Grand Prix final. Right mm -hmm. after that, a week and a half after that, and I won. I wow. beat everyone that I competed against that's, just a week and a half. That's amazing, ago. but you're like, oh, why not two weeks ago? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I jumped further than the winning jump at the Olympic Games. Oh so, my um, goodness, dog! Yeah. So, uh, real mixed feelings there. So you you win, which is amazing, but it also must feel really incredible to um, tell yourself that yes, I can do it. Right. If there was any doubt at all that I could, I proved it to myself that I right. that um that that competition. So yeah, right, Suzanne, you got a question? Uh, no, so I would then start to really love to hear how you then start to make your next life set of goals and and what you want to do. Right. How do you take that transitional experience to? Yeah. So, yeah. So let me give you a little more, a little direction on that. You, you're home. You're from. You're done with these competitions. You're like, it's mm -hmm. time to retire. Mm -hmm. What goes through your mind? How do you figure out what is next? Because I think all of us come to some nexus in our lives where we have yeah. to make a big decision. This chapter's over. Mm -hmm. What is that next thing going mm -hmm. to be? So what was that experience like for you? Yeah. Um, so let me tell you, um, I'll give you a little background of this story. Um, so I want, so I won Grand Prix final in 2000. I, I won indoor world championships in 2001. And then mm -hmm. right after that, I tore my ACL. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I spent seven years trying to work back to the same competitive form only oh to gosh. get just barely, I, just so close 
to it. Mm. And then I'd, I'd suffer an injury that, that would put me out for the rest of the season. So it happened over and over and over again. Um, so I gave myself a hard deadline and my hard deadline was 2008. Um, if I did, if I, if I didn't, if I hadn't made the Olympic team, then I was not going to compete anymore. And that's, right. that's, it was hard. It was a rough decision to make, but I made it. And when I didn't make it, I stuck with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting when um, you're a, an athlete, all athletes uh, have to retire at some point, right? Yeah. And they're young and you really have your whole life ahead of you at that sure. particular yeah. point, right? So, exactly. Yeah. yeah so, go ahead. I'm sorry. That, nah, I, got, I got nothing, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like um, you have your, your whole life ahead of you, but at the same time, you were so immersed in the, mm. your athleticism that that in your athletics, that was your life. Right. You know? Yeah, you almost have to kind of start from a different ground zero now to to kind of build up what that is as you close that one chapter and move into the next. You're exactly right, and um, and so I did that. Um, a lot of things were going on in my life that were undesirable. Um, my my father was very ill. I was mm. going through a divorce. Right. All these bad things were happening, and. Um, and then my career died athletically. So I was like, okay, right. I need something to grasp onto. You know, it's almost like a survival. It was like a survival, right. um, um, what do you call it? When you, you're just trying to survive, you're grasping for survival. Yeah, totally. I can imagine yeah. that, um, you know, that's a very deep struggle when you feel yeah. all of a sudden that you don't have direction and all of the things that you thought were solid in your life are no longer such. So mm -hmm. not only are you grappling with the the emotions of, oh my gosh, I can't compete in this way anymore. I have to find something else to do. But then all of a sudden you find out that maybe you're going to be more alone on your journey than you expected. That's really difficult to deal with, I would think. You're so good, good at explaining things. That, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's why we keep <laughs> I'll tell you, now that we've been in the uh, number one podcast in hospitality, I'm worried. I feel like I should quit now while we're at top. You know, like you were, you should have, you may have been thinking about after that world champion, you know? Right. right. Well, I was still young, so I don't know. But um, yeah, so it was, a, it, was a, <laughs> it was a tough time period. Um, I was, I had to search really deeply to figure yeah. out, you know, what I, what I loved outside of athletics. And, um, you know, I love, I love food. I love clothing. I love interior design. And I was like, I'm going to do something creative, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I settled on the art Institute and, you know, pursuing um, an education in mm -hmm. some sort of art field. So then it was based on, okay, what class starts first, you know, because I, uh, it is urgent that I get, you know, dive head first into whatever's next. And, right. and um, the culinary class started first. Um, on July, it started like on July 30th or something like that. And everything else started in October. I was like, well, I'm going to culinary school because that, you know, timing is perfect. And that turned out to be a pretty good deal for you. You really, uh, I think you really discovered who you were going to be in this next chapter of your life. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'll tell everybody, uh, you know, um, Chef Dawn um, uh, got her first James Beard nomination for Best Chef in Texas in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, which is pretty freaking awesome that you were able to uh, achieve that and you had executive chef position. So what was that part like then competing, I'm sure, against yourself as fiercely as you trained to become an Olympic competitor? Gosh, you know, I hate that I'm telling this story because I just told a sad story, but I'm going to tell another one. Uh, that's, um, all right. that's all right. We, uh, we, we actually get more viewers for sad stories. <laughs> Okay. They did just well, fight, right? Yeah. <laughs> what what we could we could cry? Let's get let's watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm happy to offer that, but you yeah, know don't worry. we'll find some laughs in there. Don't don't yeah, you worry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and true my I'm gonna be my true true transparent mm -hmm. self. So um the morning that I discovered that I was nominated for a James Beard Award, um mm -hmm. I, it was a time that, you know, it was right after my mother had a stroke and um, I had been staying at the hospital with her for three mm. and a half weeks. And um, I lived there basically. And um, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do because I didn't really know if I wanted to work anymore because I, I didn't, I wanted her to, to have everything she needed. Mm -hmm. And she lost her ability to walk by herself um, and, and speak clearly like in an instant, like it was gone. Right. You know, and so like I wanted to be there to help her with that struggle. And it meant that 
I, everything in my life was in question, including my current career that I chose. And, right. you know, now I was, I found, I was just, you know, kind of sitting at the bar at the restaurant, like, and then all of a sudden these texts start streaming in like, Oh, Don, congratulations. I was like, congratulations for what? Right. You know, and then, and then they would, they circle denomination and like, you know, you know how people do all the emojis and stuff like that. And that's like, and it was just like, I just started bawling, you know, because I was just that close to to giving all of the hard work away, um, you know, to help my mom. And yeah. and I knew she, I knew she wouldn't want it, you know. And I told her about it, and she was so happy. She was like, "Yes, you know, I'm so excited." And she was like, "But wait, what is the James Beard Award?" Well, whatever it is, <laughs> I'm I'm so happy because I know about awards. Like my children get them, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so she's like, "Well, that's fantastic. I can't believe it." And then. Yeah. Um, and so we went home and we just kind of figured it out. You know, um, we just, I stayed when I could. My, we teamed up as a family to help with our needs and I continued working and um, it all, it all worked out. That's well, great. That's, that's awesome. Because I too, unfortunately, my husband just had a stroke in October. So um, mm. I know the the deep, immense control of helping and, and needing to be there and really Putting everything into perspective, it's a tremendous amount. So, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but you, you want nothing more for your loved one than to to not suffer any more than they already have, you know. And so, um, so I had to find my balance between being there for my mother and and the career that that is turning out to be pretty successful. So, yeah, that's pretty freaking <laughs> awesome. How your career is going uh, right now? Um, it must feel really good after all that you've been through the ups the downs to you know be figuring it all out and to now be a partner executive chef with lucille's hospitality group opening up a restaurant called late august yes. um that was coming this spring but before we get to talking about all of that i i got to talk to you about making it to the finals of a uh, top chef what was that experience like for you but let's start with where did you even get the crazy idea that you could be a competitor on a TV show like that? And how did you bring that crazy <laughs> dream to reality? Well, you know, once a competitor, always competitor, right? Right. You know, um, I figured I needed to find an arena um, to, to, to showcase my skill. And I, I set my eyes on Top Chef, like, I don't know, six years prior when I wasn't even ready, just to right. make sure that I was aware of what the interview processes were and, um, and you know what, and what they to to familiarize myself more of what what they were looking for, so that when my time came, I would be ready, and it would be um, almost effortless, you know, mm -hmm. to get on the show. And um, and it was it was it it flowed so smoothly through the interview process, and I was just so proud that that they finally like accepted me, um, because I I'd applied before, uh, right? As I just told you, and um. You know, uh, and so to get there was exciting, and to to be to to go through all of these competitions were they were literally the hardest thing I've ever done. Really, My, what made what made them so hard? Sorry, sorry. sorry. That's, that's okay. So, um, as an athlete, you know, you are building toward a goal that that is constant, you know, and con consistent. So you know what to do to get, um, you know how to organize your training to get exactly to the point where you need to get, which is um, to be ready for that pinnacle performance, right? right? And Top Chef, you don't know what to do to prepare. You don't know how, what is coming at you or flying at you in these competitions. Um, and all you can do is just maintain your physical um, fitness and your mental focus and your, uh, and, um, your mental preparedness to get through each competition. So that, that's how they're different. And that's what makes Top Chef harder. Yeah, interesting. And I think that's pretty pretty cool that you looked at and went back to the deep roots of your athletic training. Because mm -hmm. I don't know how many chefs really would have had the forethought to look at six, seven years down the road and and continue to build to be prepared for that particular type of experience. Mm -hmm. So I know we're we're hosting a, a top chef competition tonight, but it's nothing like what you've done. <laughs> I, I am, uh, I'm participating in a top eating competition all week long, checking out a lot of these. You might be the winner tonight, Glenn. 
yes, yeah, so I'm going to be uh, having dinner with a uh, with a, a, a buddy over at the uh, Silverton uh, Casino Resort where he just uh, recently took a job as uh, running PR over there. I'm excited to go check out a locals casino because the environment is so different than the strip casinos where I am right now because it's a different type mm -hmm. of audience. It's a different type of consumer need. So it's a lot of fun for me to go uh, check that out. But back to you and back to food. Uh -huh. What, uh, you know, I know you trained, um, you know, with uh, Chef Tom Akins in London, you worked mm -hmm. in uh, Houston, that sort of thing. But uh, then you're an executive chef um, doing modern Southern uh, food at uh, yeah. Culture. So mm -hmm. is that kind of the type of food that you're looking to do in the future? And tell us a little bit about what type of food interests you when it comes to late August. Sure. So late August um, is going to be like a love letter to global comfort cuisine mm -hmm. um, with, with very, very um, specific uh, um, details um, gearing toward Afro-Asian -Asia fusion. Because there, there's, um, there is some um, overlap in, in the two cuisines with, with, different, with certain styles of cooking, mm -hmm. um, um, certain techniques of sauce making. And mm -hmm. I am looking to highlight those, not in... Um, you know, oh, this is a cultural study way, but it's just more in an, oh, an enlightening way um, for you can to, you're going to come to late August and you're going to be enlightened and you're going to be inspired. And that's my goal. Nice. Suzanne? It sounds great. Now, when is the restaurant slated to open? Um, in one of the J months, we're saying. <laughs> yeah, so, we, <laughs> so um, June or July. Um, we, uh, we Hopefully not to, January of next year. <laughs> I know. Definitely not the first J month. But um, either June, July, um, that's what we're gearing towards. Um, we have um, a 16-week um, timeline starting from last week. Yep. And, um, and we are on our way. So what's that process <laughs> like then? Yeah. And... Uh, I got to know what uh, I want to know how the whole process is like, but I'd also like you to tell us a little bit about what it's like figuring out what the dishes are going to be that you're yeah. going to feature when J months come along. Yeah. So these are, um, it's been really fun and um, it's not my first menu that I've written for the restaurant, but it is my, the first that, that is truly um, reflective of my, of my cooking style. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Culture was that for me. I'm, I, my family's from the South. That's my heritage. I learned to cook for my grandmother, and my aunts. So that is me. But, but I wanted to tell the full story of who I am. I worked in Asian restaurants, um, Uchi specifically, where yep. there were a lot of um, Asian cultures represented there, and it, they became a part of me. My right. coach was Chinese, um, Mandarin, cool. and and he also owned uh, owned a restaurant when they first moved to to Houston. So he knows. They know food, he and his wife. And um, right. I learned a lot of cooking technique from them as well. And yeah. it's like my second father, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, it's 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 part of me. And it and um, this is going to be a full expression of who I am culinary, culinarily speaking. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's going to be truly it's it's, it's going to be an amazing partnership. I love the idea of com combining um, uh, the, the flavors that you're talking about. Uh, Southern mm -hmm. cuisine, which of course has its uh, roots in uh, Africa and, yes. and that. And then you're talking about bringing in Asian food as yeah. well and bringing a little hodgepodge of the best of those together. That mm -hmm. sounds to me to be a winning combination. Can you give us an example of um, one dish where you feel like all of these flavors are coming together in a really successful way for you? Sure. Um, so there's a dish I made on um, on Top Chef, the the scallop dish um, in the uh, Restaurant Wars uh, mm -hmm. segment, and I made a, a seared scallop with a ham hock dashi and um, ham hock and, dashi. Cool. Yes, and a Creole XO, um, yeah. which kind of had um, it was a cross between XO and Shito. She does an um an African um chili paste that's yep. made made with, with crawfish and fish at the base, and I um and mm -hmm. I just use I just used um more southern ingredients um uh, like ham and tasso to make that right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, that's really that's really neat, right? Right there. Ben's our in-house uh, chef, if you will. None of us really cook or smoke or barbecue yeah. anything like he does. Yeah, I really, I, I, I'm a huge fan of cooking though. Obviously I'm not, 
I'm not of the caliber to actually work in a restaurant, but as far as home cooks go, I'm pretty good at following directions and I'm getting, it. Yeah. And I'm getting to the point now where I could start to experiment a little bit, but I don't mm. have that. Um, I don't have that creativity when it comes to my cooking to be able to even conceive of a dish like you're talking about right there, let alone execute it. I'm still like, um, I'm still like blown away by things like, oh, you do things with the onions and you add the spices and you let that hang out for a little while and then you put it into something else and you do this, that, the other thing. So I, I think that's really, uh, really cool. So it hasn't revealed too much about the food and I'm starving. How could you not cheer for her success? I'm uh, Mike, I'm cheering for all of us to go down there and uh, have a good meal one day. Um, yeah. So how important is um, your, your uh, your your heritage and your Southern American roots and um, African roots to you in in cooking because one of the things that I find is uh, we don't talk enough about where a lot of these dishes came from right. and and how like uh, a lot of influence was taking from when right. your, your your ancestors were torn out of Africa and maybe put in the Caribbean for a little while and then some stuff came in with like French and stuff and then brought over here it all kind of came together now I watched the most amazing documentary on Netflix called High on the Hog, um, how African-American uh, cuisine transformed uh, American food. I don't know if you've seen that, but I thought it was incredibly educational and eye-opening and really reminded me that all of the foods that I love, like uh, okra, isn't even American. It's from Africa. <laughs> right, know, that's exactly. Yeah. So, Glenn, I don't know if you, um, you realize, but my business partner, Chris Williams, was featured in High on the Hog. Um, <laughs> I did not put two or two together because honestly, if you guys are not watching that documentary, as soon as we go off air today, you're missing out. It is incredible and one of the best food shows I think I've ever seen. Yeah, I think I think it's excellent. Um, and we I was also um, so proud of 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 being featured on that. But yeah, he he went into a lot of um. A food history um, when it comes to, to southern cuisine. That's what I loved about it. Right? Yeah. Dark, it was about the history of the food with real conversations about the reality of where all of these things came together. Yes, um, indeed. And um, so my approach to food now is um, researching ingredients and and discovering their origin, and mm -hmm. um, and really trying to utilize them in every way um, possible because. Um, because they're, it's truly the food of our ancestors. What 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 once considered American food and Southern American is truly West African um, cuisine. Right. And so, um, so to follow that, um, the, the, you know, the the journey of the ingredients here is very important to tell the whole story, you know. And so, um, I'm taking it very seriously, and it is very important to me. And um, you know, from the time period that where um, the enslaved people hid grains of rice in their hair so that they can have something to eat when they got here yeah, yeah, to, the, yeah. to, um, to the time where, um, you know, they, we were eating nothing but scraps that were given yeah. to us from our, our slave masters and making right. you know, like really great dishes out of them. Um, yeah, now, I, just, uh, just so we could further explain that, because I really yeah. think it's essential for people to know the reality of what things have, have happened. So yeah. that's kind of like the genesis of where uh, modern American barbecue and smoking meats come from, because you're taking mm -hmm. a, a scrap that was unpalatable to the to the to slave masters and stuff like that and turning it into something that makes all Americans go, wow. Wow. Right? Yes. Indeed. And and so we learned to do that as um, you know, because that's what that's what was given to us and it and it turned out to be the thing now the, the things now that people crave and the way a way of life in southern cuisine. And um and I think it's truly amazing. Like I think that our ancestors are were amazing and I just want to tell these stories. Yeah, and they do they need to be told because uh okay. your ancestors had to deal with ridiculous things that I, I can't even comprehend how yeah. horrific uh, it, it must have, uh, have, have been. Um, Mike, that that documentary, again, is called High on the Hog on Netflix. So be sure to check that out. Um, so one of the other things that um, I find fascinating with you is you're not just opening up a restaurant, but with Lucille's Hospitality Group, you're going to also be focusing on their nonprofit, Lucille's 1913, which serves as a uh, 
as a, a vehicle to help create an integrated ecosystem, combating food insecurity and waste and creating training and employment opportunities and under resourced yes. neighborhoods, empowering communities and all of that. Um, and I think the, the, the way I want to enter this part of the conversation is how insane it is that a lot of African-American communities live in food deserts. And for those mm-hmm. of you who don't know, they, they, uh, a lot of these communities don't have access to great fruits and vegetables and pro- mm-hmm. you know, and proteins and all of these kinds of things, which I think has led to deleterious effects within those communities where you eat all of this fast food and then get diabetes or un- unhealthy, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, food insecurity is no security at all. Like you, um, if you, you can, um, there, there's no food, there, there are no jobs. And so therefore there's nothing to feel secure about within these, um, these communities. Yep. And so that's why um, they're left to um, sort of fend for themselves in an impoverished way. And, and what's lost is the education of, um, of food and what real food is. And mm-hmm. it, it, it happens because um, they're so far removed from what their what their what their ancestors did, like tilling their own land, growing their yeah. own food, raising their own animals. Right. And so, what we're looking to do um, in the nonprofit is to, especially in this farming community, Kendleton, which is about twenty five miles from where um, our our uh, nonprofit kitchen is, is to um, to farm this land um, and bring the farming community back to life because they have lost that that skill right. you know because their ancestors did it but you know because the farming system changed in between the 70s and the 80s um there uh, there's a generational gap and not right. not knowing what you know how to do that and trade again so um we're looking to teach them how to farm land employ um you know about, about 50 to 60 percent of the community with a with a wow. with a, a living wage and and um the and we'll be give injecting real food back into their communities which i think will be really awesome um attached to the effort will be mercantiles and stores that they the those that won't, don't work in the community um gardens or in the garden that we're planning they will be able to purchase real foods um, and so um, I think it's, I think it's going to be a great effort. And this is a reason why um, I connected uh, with Chris in the, um, on a professional level, because when he pitched this job to me, um, I decided to be his business partner after I came back from Top Chef. Um, mm-hmm. And but it was it was a I didn't want to make a hasty decision, so I really thought about it for a long time. And he's like, "You're gonna do it," and let me tell you why. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know that you love to do for people, and yeah. there's gonna be a philanthropic effort um, uh, attached to every restaurant that we have. Our nonprofit is going to make changes and differences in the world. We're gonna change the world. We're gonna change the game. And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> Yeah, we are. <laughs> now, will you see any of the food from those farms coming into your restaurant? Ooh. Um, yeah. So when we start to farm the land, and we're about, um, I, I guess you can say about a year out from doing that. We this we have the land, um, at, right now, but we're creating the infrastructure to make it happen. Um, but um, there will be three um acres of land um dedicated to to um, late August. And um, and then there's going to be a farm outside of where we're working as a nonprofit that's going to be for the nonprofit and also for the kids that are at the school um, that that's attached to where the nonprofit kitchen is. Oh, that's great. Uh, one of yeah. my um, one of my business partners, um, the restaurant um, that she was an HR manager of, they had a farm and they were trying to do the same thing up in Massachusetts. And uh-huh. I have be there on a day when um, a plethora of cucumbers, like so many cucumbers kept coming in because they had so much more than they had thought. And the chef's like, I I am getting creative with making lots of different pickled things. (laughs) So interesting. Sometimes you're, you, you have an abundance of maybe what you're not anticipating and you have to get creative with your menu. And you know what we did is that we established a fermentation lab for this reason. Um, so we also have a division of 1913 um, for ferments. And um, and so the plan was to have a place to put these overages um, and to, um, and to what is it, preserve these overages so that we can either either give them back to the community or utilize them in our restaurants. So we already have that system in place. That's awesome. That, that'll be well thought out <laughs> to be able to be successful. That's great. 
Yeah. So lo- looking looking ahead, uh, Lord Daniel says, uh, "What is John's vision of the future moving forward in 2022? Ultimately, what do you want to? What, what is what? Have? What's your vision for the future? Oh, um, my vision is, um, you know, just to continue um, to do the good work that we're doing for for people. Um, of course, um, my I also." And we'll be working closely with Chris to become, um, you know, a, a restaurateur with, mar- with multiple um, outposts mm-hmm. um, and um, multiple concepts. You know, we're working um, toward that as well. Um, my first personal one is late August, and um, but we are simultaneously working on three, and um, and I think it's going to be a really impactful. Black owned restaurant group that will that will truly change how the outlook of this industry and uh-huh. while we're simultaneously working on changing the world through food um, through food insecurity or alleviating that. So, yeah. Beautiful. Suzanne? You got Pretty inspiring. Questions? I'm just excited to see that you've had so many transferable skill transitions in your life that continues to yeah. propel you um, to that next level. Thank you. Thank uh, you so, so much. So, Dawn, uh, my, uh, my, my heritage is uh, mm-hmm. European Jewish, right? So I'm mm-hmm. thinking that we should, we should kind of combine old school Jewish food with classic Southern American African focused food. I think that would be a, a neat combination because we already got brisket. It's just Absolutely. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? So it's you like know? we're around each other, but it might, be, uh, it might be cool to do some sort of Southern matzo ball. For sure. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not unfamiliar. I had a Jewish boyfriend and, you know, so, you know, who kept kosher. So I get it. Like, no, I, I don't keep kosher. I like food too much. I want some <laughs> <I'm not fun. laughs> Awesome. Any, any final words? Um, no, just thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been really fun. And I'm, yeah. I love that. I love that. I got the chance to show you, tell you my stories and, you know, just stay tuned because we are making it happen. Awesome. How do we learn more? Give us a good shameless plug and how we could find you guys. Oh, yes. Uh, so you can find us. Uh, you can follow Lucille's Hospitality Group for all things yeah. um, going on under this umbrella. Um, Lucille's 1913. Um, we are making changes in communities. Um, you can find us there on Instagram, Lucille's 1913. And right. Chef Don Burrell, you can find me on Instagram. Beautiful. Chef Don Varel, thank you so much for being here. You are an inspiration. And uh, I think the next thing I'm going to do is run right out and get some good food. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Bye, John. Yeah, uh, Suzanne, thanks for bringing her, to, bringing her to our attention. That was really awesome. Yeah, totally. Instagram, you know, it, it's an amazing thing. And so coming off of the Olympics, I thought, what yep. better way than to try and look at um, how you pair those two? It's, there's even different unique studies that are out right. there from uh, locations of where Olympics are. And then what is the impact on those environments and communities when those events are done? That's a whole separate thing. But I wanted yep. to have some fun with food today. I love having fun with food. And you know what else I love having fun with? People downloading the audio version of our podcast. That's right. Get the audio version of No Vacancy Live on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and honestly, wherever you get your shows, we are there. Now, if you want to reach out to us, Anthony is at Anthony Hotels. I am at Traveling Glenn, and that's Dr. Producer Suzanne. Any final words? I am happy to uh, pitch, pitch in for today. Thanks for having me, and I look forward to being in the background tomorrow. Oh, actually, no, I won't be there tomorrow. Yeah, you, you are all on your own tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> tune in for that cluster, F, uh, as I welcome uh, Rob Smith, EVP of Operations with Ambridge Hospitality, the world's largest management company coming on over here. So I'll be going toe-to-toe, one-on-one with him because Suzanne and Anthony are abandoning me. That's right. Feel bad for me. Get out the tiny little violins. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. And remember, you've got one life, so blaze on and... Be kind to yourself. Beautiful. And don't forget, don't talk over. Anthony would get upset.